Good morning, as we wish you all a very blessed day in the name of the Lord as we gather around God's word. It's such an exciting thing, literally, to be leaping from mountaintop to mountaintop as we've gone through the Old Testament. And now we are literally in Matthew 21 and portions of 23. And I feel refreshed. I feel totally rebooted, retooled, and recharged. I hope that you too have experienced the blessings and the grace of the Lord. If you're tuning in for the first time, this is the Jesus Channel, the Christ Jesus College and Seminary and the Christ Jesus Chapel. And we personally invite you to subscribe, click that notification button and, and share the link with those that you love because the gospel is our main priority and we want to be able to teach and equip the word of God to men and women who are serious about serving the Lord and living in obedience and trust. This is a tuition free accelerated program for the doctorate in theology. We study the critical chapters in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have an oral exam on, on sound doctrine, and then everyone provides a original thesis to be approved by many godly men. And then we welcome everyone to the, to the alumni, the alumni of the college. Not a large college, we don't want to be. We want to be very focused. We want to be able to be sending out Navy SEALs for God, filled with love, filled with grace, filled with the spirit of, of truth, knowing how to worship God, knowing how to rightly divide the word of God, and willing to obey God no matter where he sends you. And again, I don't think it takes a genius to realize that we do live right now in very perilous times, very unpredictable times. There seems to be critical points on every juncture, on every imaginable platform. And if you're under the assumption that life is going to go back to normal, uh, I don't know what planet you're from. Prophecy is literally being unfurled and I mean, it's just coming alive. It's the kingdom of God is coming closer. And we as Christians, rather than being afraid like the world, we are rejoicing because we're going to be seeing soon the face of the one who loved us unto death. I want to welcome Faithful Bishop Buddha, Dr. Peter Davila, fellow missionary to, to Cuba, and all our brothers and sisters in the Christ Jesus Chapel and the college. May God bless you. Today's talk is the rejection of Israel by Jesus. So we have a lot to a lot of ground to cover this morning. So. Let's ask for God's benediction this morning, that God will bless us, illuminate us, and grant us discernment in these most uncertain times. I'm reading from Matthew 21, so I'll be reading from verses 9 to 17, and then 23 to 46. And so, so to save time, I'll be reading and making commentary, so feel free to take notes as I as I take these scriptures and allow the Holy Spirit to instruct us. Matthew 21, verse 9. Now, this is just after Jesus entered into Jerusalem, fulfilling the prophecy in the Old Testament that thy king shall enter the city of David in meekness, riding on a colt, riding upon an ass. And Jesus does that in the most remarkable manner. Here we are in verse 9. And the multitudes went before 
and that and those that followed him. So there were people before Jesus and after Jesus. He was definitely the center. I mean, it's amazing. This is a week prior to the crucifixion. You can just see the fame and the popularity just overflowing. And they were crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. And that's prophetic. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So they were saying all the right words. Is it possible that you could be saying the right words and still be offbeat? Let's find out. Verse 10. And when Jesus was come into Jerusalem, and we read in Matthew 5 that we are not to swear our yes should be yes, our no should be no, but if we and we're not to swear by heaven because it belongs to God, nor are we to swear by Jerusalem because it is the city of the king. This city does not belong to any country, it is the city of the great king, according to the King James Version. And that king, of course, is Jesus. And when Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, the whole city was, was moved, and they asked a the question. Who is this? Do you remember when Jesus was born? And the wise men came to King Herod and said, Where is the king of Jews? Where is he born? What does it say? All of Jerusalem was greatly troubled. They weren't excited about Jesus' birth. They were not excited about his arrival upon the earth, the fulfillment of prophecy. Here they are. They're saying, Who is this? And the multitude, this is the social media of the day, and the multitude said, and now this is where they get it all wrong. This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Here they are in one sentence saying, Hosanna to the son of David. If you really believe that he's the son of David, then you believe that he's the son of God. You believe he's the fulfillment of all the prophecies in the Old Testament. And when they're asked, who is this? Well, they put on the same level as John the Baptist. He's just a prophet. He's one of the prophets. He's from, actually, he's not from, he's not, he's not from Judea. He's from Galilee. He's from, from Nazareth. And what does Jesus do? Jesus, goes, Jesus is a man of action. I mean, he goes, he, it's a beeline. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out... I mean, this is really, really, I mean, I don't think any movie can really portray this properly. He cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. I'm going to pause here for a moment. When I, when I first got ordained, I became a pastor of a Baptist church. I was appalled to see what was going behind the scenes in the church. I don't think it's any different today. Many churches are run as a business. This is wrong. We've, I had, I, I'll be very honest with you, I resigned. It was all wrong. It was all about the money, the people, the politics, the power, the prestige. That's not the reason why we go into the service of the Lord. And to find out that not only that church, but many other churches. Now, don't get me wrong. There are many godly, spirit-filled churches. Praise the Lord for that. And we need more of that. But I will tell you, point blank range, I have personally gone to many churches, and they will say to me, to my face, brazenly, we are in the business of the Lord. What does that mean? We are to be preaching the gospel and sharing the love of Christ. This is very interesting. He overthrows the table of the money changers. See, if you went to the temple, you had to use the currency of the temple. And so the Pharisees allowed money changers to be there because people came from very far away and could not bring a lamb or, or a bullock or a dove, 
And so they're making a business out of it. It's like a bank. And this is very interesting. He overthrows the seats of them that sold doves. Why is that so important? Because if you were rich, you could afford a goat, a lamb, a bull. But it was the poor people who could only afford a dove. And when you read very carefully at the beginning of the life of Jesus, Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, and Mary go to dedicate Jesus at the temple, and they are so poor. They're on Medicaid. They're on Medicare. They, they have nothing. And all they could offer to dedicate and say thank you to God, all they could afford was a dove. And he said unto them, I remember I had asked a question several days ago, and I have to be very honest with you, most of the scholars did not get the answer correct. I said, why is music not considered worship in the house of God? Today, music is, is used as, as entertainment. It's, it's incredible. It's like the music is so loud and booming. It's like, if the church has good music, then I'll go to that church. Where is that in Scripture? He says here, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You see, a lot of people go to churches for the wrong reason. They go to church because it's got great music, great entertainment, a lot of young people, things are happening, it's got a lot of programs. That's not a, that's not a church that, that's anointed by God. A church that's anointed by God is when you have godly people who are on their knees, who are praying, who are beating their chest and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. People ask me when I was young, in high school and college, where did I spend New Year's Eve? No, not at a party. We were in church. We would have a potluck dinner. Then we would read the scriptures. And then an hour before midnight, and one or two hours after midnight, we spent in prayer ushering the new year because we made the house of the Lord a house of prayer. Very unlike today. And he said, you have made my house a den of thieves. Now, this quickly goes into verse 14. I want you to see how Matthew shifts now the camera. Jesus is angry. Jesus is very, very angry. They're saying he's just a prophet. They're saying, who is this? They're making the temple a, a, a den of thieves. And right away, Matthew changes the camera lens and he focuses on something else. It's very important. Don't miss this. The blind and the lame. The blind can't see where they're going, so they're being led. The lame can't walk, so people are carrying them. This is a very visual effect. I wish I was a director of a movie. I would really focus on this very much. They were brought to Jesus in the temple, and Jesus heals them. Now, verse 15, the camera changes again. Matthew is very, very good at giving the facts. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that Jesus did, and this is what bothered them the most. And the children crying in the temple. They were crying while they were singing. Hosanna. Hosanna to the son of David. What does it say? They were sore, displeased. They were very angry. They were ticked off. And they said to Jesus, Hearest thou what they say? Are you listening to what they're saying to you? And Jesus replies to them and said, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? He uses the Psalms to rebuke them. Now, I love this. This is so action-packed. The camera now changes focus and, and the aperture and, and the angle changes. And Jesus now leaves Jerusalem as quickly as he, as he comes in. He leaves. And do you notice that Jesus never sleeps in Jerusalem? He doesn't trust Jerusalem. He doesn't trust the Pharisees. He doesn't trust the high priest. He goes to Bethany and he lodges there. Now we're going to skip to verse 23. Jesus now is coming back into the city. 
This is the following day. And when Jesus came into the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came unto Jesus. This is really, I have to warn you. Uh, this is not for the faint-hearted, okay? If you, if, you, if you want to tune out now, this is probably your best time. Right? This, I'm giving you a warning here. This is, this is bad. The chief priests and the elders of the people came to him and, and, and they interrupted Jesus. Jesus was teaching and said, excuse me, excuse me. And says, by what authority, by what authority do you do these things? Who gave you this authority? And this is just mind boggling. They just saw Jesus heal the blind. They just saw Jesus heal the lame. And now, even after a, a whole night of thinking about what they just saw, they're coming to Jesus and they're interrupting Jesus while he's preaching and teaching. And they're saying, hey, you, mister, who gave you this authority? Now, I want you to give, this is going to be a very interesting insight here. This is how the judgment is going to be done at the judgment seat. Jesus is not going to say, you are a sinner. And you go to hell. He's going to be asking questions. And from your own mouth, you're going to be convicted. I should say we. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, and likewise will I tell you by what authority I do these things. You see, Jesus always asked a question. He answered a question with a question. And he goes now to a very important topic. John the Baptist, his cousin. He says, the baptism of John, whence was it? Was it from heaven or from men? Mm. Jesus is one. I mean, he put Sherlock Holmes and, and the Attorney General and the Department of Justice to shame. He knows how to ask a question. It's one critical question. It's the camel breaker. And it says here, and they reasoned among themselves. They got together in a huddle. They were thinking, and, and, and they were having a council. And they were, and they were reasoning. It's, hmm, if we say from heaven, then Jesus will say, well, why didn't you believe John? And then he said, well, we, if we said of men, and I hear this very carefully, it says, it says we fear the people. You see, the Bible says the fear of men is a snare. The fear of men is a trap. We, we, are, we are taught throughout all the Old Testament and the New Testament that we are to fear the Lord, to fear God. So they said, we fear, we fear the people for they hold John as a prophet. Now look how ridiculous these high priests are. They come in verse 27 and said, we cannot tell. We can't answer that question. And Jesus said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. You play with fire, you get burnt with fire. When are we going to learn that there's consequences to sin? You see, when a wife underestimates or undermines the authority of her husband, there's problems. When children don't respect the authority of the father in the house, then there's problems. When the pastor of the church, who is godly, and he's serving the church, he's giving his heart and soul, and he's preaching and teaching, and his authority is coming to question by the elders, problems are going to, are going to occur. We're living in a country today where there, there is no respect of authority. My friends, this is very sad. There are going to be consequences. So what does Jesus do? He drives it in home. He says, but what think ye? He says, a certain man, and this is a father, he had two sons, and he goes to the first and says, son, go to work in the vineyard. And, he's, and the first son says, I will not. But afterward, here's the key word, he repented and he went. He went to the second son and said, son, Go to the vineyard and work. And said, yes, sir, I'll go. But he went not. Now Jesus asked another question. My friends, don't play with Jesus. 
you will always lose. Snake eyes. Whither of the twain did the will of the father? And from their own mouth, they tell the truth. This is the first. And Jesus says to them, I mean, this is like really, I mean, this is like a complete roundhouse. This is a real, I mean, this is devastating. This is verily. Whenever Jesus says verily or truly, truly, this is, it's heavy duty stuff. Verily I send to you, the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. You guys are not even going to make it. The sinners came. They repented. They're going to enter the kingdom of God, but you are not. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And when you saw what he did, and when you came and spoke to him, you repented not. And friends, repentance is the key to salvation. Now he gives him another parable. And this is a bone breaker. Here another parable. You think Jesus is finished? When Jesus is angry, he's never finished. He's the king. There's nothing to bind him or, or, or to, con to, to contain what he has to do. He gives him another parable. And this is a very important parable. There was a certain householder, a landowner. Who's the landowner? God owns the earth, not the nations. Which planted a vineyard, put a hedge about it. He digged a wine press, built a tower, and he left it to the farmers. He left it to the husbandmen, and he went into a faraway country. And when it came time for harvest, he sent his servants to these farmers that he might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen, the farmers, took his servants. They beat one. They killed another. And they stoned another. Sound familiar? And again, he sent other servants, more than the first. And they did unto him, unto them likewise. Oh, how the prophets suffered in the Old Testament. How John suffered. But, last of all, they, he, he, meaning God, he sent unto them his own very beloved son, Jesus, saying, they will have reverence, they'll respect my son. But when the farmers, or the husbandmen, and we're talking about the Pharisees and the scribes, the legal authority, when they saw the son, when they saw Jesus, they said among themselves, ha ha, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him. And let's seize his inheritance. And what do they do? Exactly as they purpose in their heart. It says here in verse 39, they caught him. Happened in Gethsemane. They cast him out of the vineyard. They took him outside Jerusalem. And they slew him upon a tree. Now, the questions don't end here. The interrogation, the cross-examination doesn't end here. You asked a very important, you came to Jesus while he was teaching. You asked him, who are you? Who gives you the authority? Jesus is just, Jesus is just going, I mean, Jesus is just, he's in like 15th gear here. He says here, now when the Lord of the vineyard returns, what will he do to the husbandman? Now see how Jesus gets the truth out of these sinners. He will miserably destroy those wicked men. Well, what happened to Jerusalem? What happened to the temple? What happens to Judaism? They just predicted it. And he will let out, he will give the vineyard to other husbandmen who shall render their fruits in their seasons. Now Jesus now gives them the scriptures. He gives them the law. Did you ever read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. And this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Who's that cornerstone? Jesus. 
What is that stone from heaven that was thrown and destroyed that beautiful statue that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about? Jesus. And 43 is a heart wrencher. Jesus now gives the final rejection to Israel. He gives the final rejection to the high priest. He gives the he gives a final rejection to to Judaism. He says, "Therefore I say unto you, this is hard for me to read. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you." These are not my words, my friend. I'm a simple I'm a, I'm a simple man with with simple tastes. I'm a, I'm a mailman. I'm just a messenger. Verse 43 says it, therefore I, meaning Jesus, say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing, forth, bringing fruits thereof. Now he gives a warning. Think he's finished? You think Jesus is finished? you got to be kidding me. And whoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken. You cannot play with this cornerstone. See, they tried to build the temple of Solomon, but they didn't start with the cornerstone. They built the entire temple of Solomon, and they couldn't find the cornerstone. The cornerstone was placed in last. And it's exactly what happens here. They put all their focus on the temple, on the rituals, on the, on the, the traditions, the catechism of men. If you fall on this stone, if you fall on me, you'll be broken. And if I fall on you, you'll be ground to powder. Now, when the chief priests perceived that they had spoken of them, these guys were just ruthless. They were ferocious. They had completely no conscience. They saw it. They were trying to figure a way how to, to lay hands on him to kill him. But then once again, they feared the multitude. Oh, how the public leaders fear the multitude because they took Jesus as a prophet. Even the, even the multitude got it wrong. They didn't see Jesus as the king. They didn't see him as the son of God. Now, I'm going to close this here because it's important that you read Matthew 21 with Matthew 23 to see this in comparison. Because Matthew 23 now, Jesus literally is going to take out his spiritual machine gun and it's going to be woe unto you, woe unto you, woe unto you. It's going to be curse after curse after curse after curse after curse. He's headed up to here with the high priest. He's headed up to here with the scribes and the legal authority. And he says in Matthew 23, verses 38 to 39, which is totally prophetic. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And I say unto you, and this is true today, my friends, we're waiting for this to be fulfilled in a certain country in the Middle East that does not want to accept the fact that the Messiah has already arrived and coming again for a second time. He says, you will not see me henceforth till you learn to say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Heavy duty stuff. But this is the inerrant perfect word, the holy word of God. May we be instructed that we need to take Jesus seriously. We need, to, we need to take his authority seriously. We need to be thankful that we, as the Gentiles, have been grafted into the olive tree. But we should not take that for granted. And we should not be boasting about it. But we should be living our life, not by the law, because Jesus puts the old law, the covenant, away and, and now fulfills and brings the new covenant. And what is that? Two simple things. Loving God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Once again, 
I love you. He loves us the most. And may the peace of the Lord be guarding and protecting your mind and heart. We really need that today. We need that peace that passes all understanding because there's so much nonsense going on. Every time you watch the news, there's something really nutty that's going on. But make no mistake about it. Prophecy is being unfurled before our very eyes. Jesus is at the door. And we as his children are ready to receive him. And we are busy at work, pleasing the master, staying very focused on the mission statement of preaching the gospel. My friends, that's the only thing that's going to count. You're not taking anything with you. Whatever you own, whatever you possess, you're not taking it with you. All it's going to count, all, all that Jesus is going to ask you, like he asked the Pharisees, he's going to say to me, he's going to say to you, what did you do with the gospel? May you have a very blessed day, and please be safe.